Welcome to the Plymouth Barnstable District Candidate Forum for State Senator. I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC TV, and I'm joined by Amy Naples, Executive Director of the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We want to take a moment to thank our candidates for participating in this forum and bringing this informational programming to residents and voters this election season. Let me explain the format. Tonight, the two candidates for state senator for the Plymouth Barnesville District, incumbent Senator Susan Moran and Carrie McRae, will be participating. Each candidate will be introduced in alphabetical order. They will have two minutes to introduce themselves and speak about who they are and why they are running for this elected office, as well as describing their qualifications for the position. The candidates will then be asked a series of questions related to state and local issues. They will have up to three minutes to answer each question. After, there will be a post-response, a point-counterpoint, if you will, where the candidates can interact with each other, the time being determined by the moderators. Candidates will be hearing questions for the first time and will not receive coaching or information to assist in answering. They appear alone in the studio. Members of their campaign staff are not present in the room. The forum will close with each candidate having the opportunity to address any topic not covered or revisit an issue. These remarks will also be held to a three-minute time frame. This will not be a debate per se, but rather an opportunity for the candidates to let voters know who they are and where they stand on certain issues. Thank you. Ready to begin? We will start with opening statements. Mrs. McRae, you are up first. You have two minutes. Thank you very much for holding this um, forum today. And um, I really appreciate, you know, this, this time that you've given us. And thank you, Senator Moran, for, for being in attendance. I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, so why I'm running. My name is Carrie McRae, and I am running for state senate for the because our district needs a state senator that will be an independent voice rather than a rubber stamp politician. I am running to be your voice on Beacon Hill. The previous senator, um, the previous Republican state senator, Vinny DiMacedo, set a pattern I wish, to, I wish to follow and I wish to learn from and implement in actually getting things done specifically for our district. As a lifelong resident of the Plymouth and Barnstable district, I care about our community and I promise to work hard to grow and expand its excellence. My husband, David, of 27 years, our four children and five grandchildren, live in the Bourne and Falmouth communities and look forward to raising many more generations in years to come. As a business high school educator, having helped thousands of children, students over the years, I focused on building their confidence, nurturing their leadership skills, and encouraged them to be independent thinkers. As an elected school board member, um, my goal was to support students and their families the taxpayers and our teachers, ensuring we provide the resources that they need necessary for success, while keenly focused, of course, on fiscal responsibility. I am running for state senate because I am you. I am a citizen in the community that is worried about affordability and sustainability of our great district. I am asking for your vote on November 8th. Senator Moran, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thank you, Carrie, for joining me. For those viewers who don't know me, my name is Sue Moran and I am the state senator for the Plymouth Barnstable District for three and soon to be four towns on each side of the canal, including Plymouth. Before joining the Senate in 2020, I spent 30 years as a community leader getting to know people of different parties, different walks of life, and different opinions at the grassroots level serving in local government, volunteering for as many boards, committees, and service organizations as I could alongside my career as an attorney, small business owner, and most importantly, mom of three. My passion from service, for service comes from foremost my dad, a disabled Air Force veteran and a proud union member. He's constantly fighting for people and causes in our town when I was a kid and taught me the value of advocacy at an early age. Two years ago, an opportunity to run for Senate presented itself and I jumped at the chance because I wanted to deliver the necessary resources for Beacon Hill to the communities that I'd already been fighting so hard for. Every single day, alongside my incredible staff, I field dozens of phone calls and emails. 
constituents are in need of help, and I've spent thousands of hours crisscrossing the district talking to people about the challenges they're facing. As we discuss the issues tonight, I hope that you'll recognize in me someone who has listened and is going to work tirelessly to get you the resources and relief that you and your neighbors need and deserve. I know how much there's left to do. Being the state senator for the Plymouth Barnstable District has been the joy and honor of my life, and I plan to earn every vote this November in order to keep fighting for you. Thank you. We will now move on to our first question, which is followed by response time from each candidate. Our first question involves a couple of the ballot questions. I'm going to ask you about two of these questions separately. You'll have up to two minutes to answer each part. First ballot question is number one. It's a proposed amendment to the state constitution and would be additional tax on income over $1 million. Can you explain what the ballot question is, why it is or isn't needed, and your position on it? And we're going to begin with Senator Moran. Thank you very much. So uh, the ballot question is focused on funding education and transportation. It um, essentially, uh, ta it's called the millionaire's tax um, for shorthand uh, because it would tax about four cents a dollar over a million. What I like about the proposal uh, which will be on the ballot so the citizens will get to decide is that it's a job, jobs creator really. Um, we look at um, when times in our history uh, have been tough, um, great leaders have put folks to work, uh, union members to work, building roads, transportation systems, and have also focused on education. The uh, education is the bedrock of our community and we know full well that uh, during this pandemic our teachers have been on the front line. Most people know my daughter Jolene was a teacher of fourth grade students and spent many evenings while I was babysitting her two kids getting back on email to her, you know, her children and the parents of those kids. Uh, the reason it's important right now is because people want to pivot to well-paying jobs. Uh, people want to be sure we have safe roadways. In the Plymouth Barnstable District, we're going to have two new bridges. And those are the kinds of uh, funding opportunities that we need in order to give an influx into the small business owners who well deserve our support. So I'm a, I'm a positive on one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. McCray, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure. Okay. So the ballot question one is a proposed amendment to the state constitution that would be an additional tax on income over $1 million. Can you explain the ballot question itself, why it is or isn't needed, and your position on it? And you will have two minutes. Thank you for the question. Um, I will say right off the bat, I do not support. Um, I will be voting no on um, the millionaire's tax. Um, there are many reasons why I'm voting no. One is because I feel that as I've been crisscrossing the district as well and talking to people, even just yesterday in a parking lot at CVS, um, a young woman said that she has a full-time job as a nurse and in the evenings she's um, doing door dashing um, just to make ends meet. And I feel that right now we have a surplus in Massachusetts that we're trying to figure out how to get back to the people. and for that reason and many, I just don't feel that we need to tax any more um, people in our state or in our district. Taxes are, um, you know, tax revenue is not a problem for Massachusetts. Uh, people often say tax Massachusetts because we are taxed on so many things. And, you know, I understand um, the Senator's position about that we need to do, we need to bring in resources for um, uh, you know, infrastructure, and we do have the bridges that we have to deal with. But right now, we have a surplus. We have, um, you know, the millionaires, if you will, or people that would be affected by such of, of, of an amendment to the Constitution um, are already putting in more tax dollars than, than the regular, um, you know, everyday uh, citizen. So mm -hmm. I will never um, support a increase in tax dollars or tax... Um, uh, taxes for any citizen in Massachusetts. So okay. I'm voting no. Okay, so a yes and a no. Do you want any more back and forth rebuttal? Sure, thank One you. One minute. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we do need new roadways and we do need uh, more support in our education system. The taxpayers will be soon getting back 2.9 billion under 62F, which is about a 13 percent for each person. Spend it any way you want. It's going to go into your bank account. Uh, hopefully spend it locally. The, uh, the thought where the, about the DoorDash person who I incredibly, um, I've supported uh, small businesses my whole life. I've been a small business lawyer. I know it inside and out. And this is a tax just on the uh, small percentage of people who make over the million. It's not a tax even on the first million. And the four cents per dollar that it works out in that regard, I think, is um, needed support. And also the DoorDash folks can be accepted out through the policy. So I'm looking forward to working with the community to have that conversation. Um, Ms. McCray, would you like to? Sure. Um, I think it comes down to we, we have a, a spending problem in Massachusetts. Um, Beacon Hill, it's all about money, money, money. It's about how much more money we can get from, from us, the people. And I'm somebody who struggles and lives pretty much paycheck to paycheck. If I have anything left over at the end of, at the, end of the week, I'm excited to be able to put that aside for a rainy day, if you will, and to try to build back that rainy day fund. Uh, we're struggling right now, and I think the last thing we need to do is to create any more tax, um, any more pull on anyone's pocket. Okay, thank you, both of you. Uh, ballot question number four is eligibility for driver's licenses. Can you explain the ballot question, why it is or isn't needed, and your position on it? Mrs. McRae, you're going to go first, and you have two minutes. Thank you. So um, I will be voting no on ballot question four. Um, the, the ballot question, which I am very, very proud to be part of getting that question on the um, on the ballot, which is basically whether or not to um, to authorize or to keep the uh, Senate Senate and House legislation that approved driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. I think there are many reasons why I do not believe that um, undocumented immigrants should have driver's licenses. Um, you know, one is as an undocumented um, uh, resident, you don't legally have the right to have a job. Um, so, you know, I've heard, I've heard the argument back and forth about, well, how will they get to work? Um, I, I absolutely completely um, uh, promote uh, legal immigration. Um, my grandfather came from Ireland, legally immigrated here. Many, many people that I've talked to across even the um, the, about across the district in Falmouth who have legally immigrated here do not support the illegal, um, you know, uh, dri the driver's license for undocumented um, immigrants. Now, I think that we need to have a better path for people to become um, legal residents. I think that there's a problem with the system that we have right now. But for me, by giving undocumented, um, keyword undocumented, um, um, immigrants, driver's licenses and um, IDs in Massachusetts, you know, is, is, is just acknowledging and accepting, um, you know, a law that was broken by coming here illegally. Thank you. Senator Moran, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I've got it. Thank you. Okay, you have two minutes. Appreciate that. So in the Plymouth Barnstable District, one of the foundations of our community uh, is our immigrant community in terms of our economy. Uh, we are largely tourism based. Um, we have great big hospitals. Um, we have a terrific mosaic of people that work in those jobs and immigrants do in fact work in those jobs. The, uh, it's, you know, for years and years we have integrated folks into our, our community. A uh, friend of mine, um, I was on the tourism committee, oh goodness, about 15 years ago, just starting in Falmouth when its terrific restaurants were just starting to stay open all the time. I ran a and b at the time and also um, had to run my family and, and, and my law firm. And the thing that I learned and that I, that I hear right now is that, you know, what what we need is, is more um, 
options for, for people, literally a path to citizenship, and make sure that, that it is solid and um, can move ahead and everyone knows what to expect. Um, I think the knowledge and communication is incredibly important. The, uh, the fact that um, the State, some state police, chiefs associations, business organizations, many, many people favor question two, as do I, because the simple reason it's going to make everyone uh, safer. If there is an accident, you know that person has insurance and you'll be covered with that insurance. Um, people who have licenses are actually qualified and know how to drive. It's a safety issue and it's an economic issue. Okay. Would you like to um, one yes. minute to rebut? Okay, Thank you. go ahead. Um, so one thing that I did notice um, about what Senator Moran was saying is at no point in time did she address the fact that this is about undocumented immigrants. Like I said before, I completely support people coming here, as do most people in our state and in our districts specifically. Um, we have a, a lot of immigrants that are in our community, and unfortunately we have a lot of undocumented immigrants in our com community as well. And the key word here is undocumented. So, you know, I have a driver's license in Massachusetts. I am being forced to get a real ID. And the reason why that is, is because the federal government at this point, a couple of years ago, was already questioning and struggling with Massachusetts driver's license and whether or not they were doing their um, due diligence as far as um, documentation. So when I go to get my real ID, I need to show many, many um, pieces of information and proof to validate who I am. But we want to give driver's license to people that we can't validate. Okay. Uh, Senator Moran? Thank you. So the real ID came about as a matter of um, safety and technology improvement. I got mine right away. Um, it wasn't difficult at all. And, you know, it's interesting. We're, we are talking about documents, right? So if the driver's license bill passes, what happens is um, folks who have come from other countries would present documentation that would be reviewed by professionals who do this day in and day out and who are set up for that process. It would be centralized. And when we are in an accident, on the street or when the police come, and this is why many police support it, they will know exactly who's involved and exactly how to resolve the situation. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our second question. The success of economic development is interwoven with many varied subject matters. Access to water and transportation, land management, infrastructure, and even public relations on how it's our geographical area is marketed and viewed. So candidates, here is your question. What makes our area ripe for economic development and what are the challenges that must be addressed for successful outcomes? We will start with Senator Moran and you have three minutes. Thank you for the question, but this is something I'm incredibly excited about because economic development saves individual taxpayers and families money because it's an infusion of what I like to call OPM, other people's money, into restaurants, hotels, small businesses. Uh, what we've been able to do locally with my legislative uh, partner, Rep. Matt Muratori, we have uh, started uh, with $150,000 that we brought to the greater Plymouth community in order to look at what a convention center in the greater area would add. What should it look like? Um, Lee Filsom has been asking regular citizens, what would be good? What would you not want? Um, in the, um, the committee that I chair, uh, Consumer Protection and Public Licensure, uh, we actually have gone inside and spoken with many Plymouth restaurateurs. I just did a tour a couple of weeks ago, walking the sidewalk on Main Street and asking people. But before that, um, we brought the Workforce uh, Committee right to Plymouth and had a committee session where um, it was consumer protection, it was business people. It was still the middle of COVID to say how can we best help you? What do you need to keep your business open? What are your concerns? What are the things, if you know you now have a voice at the table, tell us what would be helpful. And what we found 
is that outdoor dining is, uh, you know, something that people were trying out. They thought they could um, maybe, you know, provide their services in a healthier way. Plymouth Chamber of Commerce, uh, through Amy Naples' leadership, I have to say, took off on it. And I think was, um, in, in all of my towns, was probably one of the, the, the chambers right in the forefront of that. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of communication. It's just like I, I did a road, a road improvement when I chaired the Board of Selectmen in 28A because people were concerned. What's this state going to do? Am I going to lose my front yard? As chair of the Board of Selectmen, I said, I understand. Those are concerns that many, many people have that I would have, in fact. So I started a committee where you can speak directly with the state, directly with the engineers, and go ahead and... Um, Tell us what would work for you. I want to save that tree. I don't want kids playing with a ball to be too close to the roadway. I don't, I don't want the speed that way. These are the kinds of things. It's communication with the community that serve us best in economic development. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Senator. And Mrs. McRae, you have three minutes. Would you like me to repeat the question? <laughs> the success of economic development is interwoven with many varied subject matters access to water and transportation, land management, infrastructure, and even public relations, how is our geographical area marketed and viewed? So candidates, what makes our area ripe for economic development and what are the challenges that must be addressed for successful outcomes? Well, I will say that um, I think what makes us um, ripe for development, um, as you said, is, is definitely that we have year-round beautiful um, landscaping and we have um, uh, amazing growth as far as even in Plymouth with uh, the waterfront and um, the Main Street and even Senator Maria mentioned about the outdoor dining that you know is even nice in the spring and the fall so I think um, I think that one thing that we do need to do is offer more incentives and I'm not sure exactly what they are you know I'm new to politics I I'm sure that there was a lot of red tape that has to be um, unwound and and it goes back on and we have to unwind it again and and maneuver through and manage through but I will say that you know even in um, uh, even in Buzzards Bay, you know, we, we redid, we, we did wonderful infrastructure, we, um, uh, you know, established a, a beautiful park and, and water parks and, and all types of great um, uh, places for people to come and enjoy and for the people in our district to enjoy as well. One of the issues that I find that we have is that we kind of put the horse before the cart. And I think that if we do more planning and we um, are uh, very scrupulous about how we spend the resources that we do have, because they are limited, that that will, um, that will allow us to continue to build on our infrastructure. Um, but I will say that a challenge is, you know, we need new thoughts, we need um, new visions, and as somebody who supports term limits, um, even locally or uh, across the country, I think that having new people in and having um, new ways of thought and new contacts that people bring to the table, that that might help us to, to, uh, to bring creative solutions to issues that have really been longstanding. Okay, um, so Lorraine, would you like a minute to do a point counterpoint? Thank you so much. Um, so as a lawyer, I majored in red tape. I know exactly how to bring benefits to the community, especially having listened to folks. When you, uh, new ideas often come from constituents. I've run a housing forum as your state senator about every other month and brought together municipal leaders, builders, and affordable housing folks, along with transportation. And I brought them together with the state, which is bringing grants. So uh, we would know how do you, how, what's the best way to get on the fast track for those grants? Uh, my background, I was on the Water Quality Coalition for Barnstable County for years and years. And I think um, on that, I want to compliment uh, Plymouth Board of Selectmen for really looking at policies so that they can publish to the community how to do correct building in the right places so that we use our water resources in the most economical way. 
And Mrs. McCray, go ahead, yeah. you have a minute. Thank you. Um, one other thing that I just thought about too is I know that even in Falmouth, um, there's a lot of changes that are happening as far as um, uh, you know cables being proposed and windmills out in the bay and um, many things that I think personally are going to impact um, the the community and not in the best um, in the best way. I've spoke with many business owners um, in that uh, waterfront area. Um, and they're concerned about, you know, they just started these new businesses. They've invested all this money, um, personal money, and, and profits that they've been able to um, succumb in, you know, dealing with 2020 with COVID and, and all this pandemic stuff. And I think that we need to um, really think long and hard before we bring any, um, uh, any of these um, green energy um, uh, thoughts that could impact our small businesses. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to now move on to our third question. The past two and a half years have revealed what we already knew, that there are cracks in our health care system, especially mental health services. While no one has been untouched, the biggest impact has been on our youth and on our seniors. From access to cost, this is a subject that affects everyone. How can you, in an elected position, be the most effective in addressing this issue? We're going to begin with Mrs. McRae. You're going to have three minutes. Okay. Um, you know, there are many, many programs that we have across the state that deal with substance abuse, that deal with um, mental health um, issues, whether it be severe um, or even just everyday, you know, moms dealing with postpartum depression or, um, you know, workers that, you know, have been stuck at home working from their office in their basement don't realize what that impact is happening until a year later. Um, I think that what, I think that the state and the legislators have tried really hard to, um, to improve those things. But the needle isn't moving. And what's happening is if you have private, um, private help for mental health or private um, pay for um, uh, some of these uh, drug abuse clinics and things like that, that those systems seem to be um, more successful. And I think what we need to do is we need to look at what we're doing with the resources that we have that are limited because, you know, students in schools are overdosing in bathrooms. Um, homeless veterans are, you know, overdosing or, or freezing to death because they're outside. And we see this, we see that it's rising, we see that the pandemic um, obviously further um, uh, exasperated that. Um, we have issues with uh, mental health workers being in limited staffing. We have so many um, jobs that, frankly, have become um, online and Zoom types of jobs, even with the healthcare industry, that we're, we're losing human touch. We're losing human um, interaction. You know, I, I've, I've joked, I've, I've done two debates now with Senator Moran, and each time I hugged her. Right? And I think it's because we need to be humans and we need to respect each other and be, um, bring back humanity. During the, um, I lost an aunt during COVID and I think about how she was in a hospital room by herself without her family sitting there because you know, we, were, we were scared about the process and scared about um, so many things and I understand that. But I think if we bring things back to um, being humans and going about everything, remembering that we need to have more humanity with all of these programs, we'll see better success. Thank you. Um, would you like the question repeated? I'm good. Okay, you have three minutes, Senator Moran. Thank you, Julie. I actually have a degree in mental health and psych, and I worked five years in an uh, inpatient hospital with populations including addictions treatment, uh, adults, adolescents, and even children. And I was proud to have worked this year with Senator Sear leading a mental health bill in the Senate where mental health is to be treated same as every other health care. Um, so that um, things that, that 
are expensive and that folks need can't always be privately funded. Uh, people who have jobs um, and have a, a mental health issue, it goes right to that person's business if someone needs to be out. We need to support families and individuals with mental health concerns uh, any way that we can. One of the um, things that a lot of people are just starting to get their arms around, including healthcare providers, are that addictions treatment is so interwoven, and we're including alcohol. Alcohol is a huge uh, contributor in complicated uh, mental health situations. I've, you know, I did a ride around with um, uh, Captain Higgins in the Plymouth Police Department. And um, really just an incredible experience, well-trained, um, incredible staff on the line that we have here in Plymouth. And one of the things um, that came to mind through that is how much time uh, police, who are experts in public safety, are really called upon to also um, have mental health uh uh, sort of training to, to just help people in de-escalate situations, which is uh, which they're very good at. The and so I have put money into the Massachusetts budget for police to have mental health uh, folks go with them when they're needed, so the police can continue on their main public health mission. Um, the you know when you look at um, the the opioid crisis. Um, as your state senator, we are right now putting together, just like we've had a housing forum about every six weeks, we're right now putting together uh, an opioid and fentanyl program. And it's going to be based upon um, really contributions in the, in the conversation from DAs, um, from police, from uh, treatment professionals. And to really look at how do we stop this? It's killing our kids. It's hurting our families. It's hurting our economy, our business. And I'm, I'm going to tackle that um, going forward. We've got the guest list already started. OK. Would you like a minute to rebut? I would. Okay. That would be great. Um, listening to Senator Seattle actually reminded me of something. Um, I know that right now there's, and, and I'm still trying to get through all of the bills that, that are out there, because um, there are quite a few that you know are, are um, presented. And I know that one bill, um, there was a, um, a legislative aide in the state police that reached out to me and said that there was a bill that actually is trying to take um, money um, and property that um, the police actually confiscate during, uh, you know, criminal investigations, arrests, and things like that. Um, a wealth of money that actually is confiscated right here at our, um, uh, uh, the airport in Boston. And, you know, one of the, uh, one of the great things about the police departments and the state police having the authority to use those funds to um, provide better resources and um, and really fund a lot of the um, the mental health training and things like that is is done in that bill and I think that that's why it's important that we do give the police all the resources that they need to help with this crisis. Okay, Senator Moran, I, we let her go a little longer, so you have a little bit more than a minute Sorry. to rebut. That's great. I appreciate that. So let me tell you how that happened. Uh, just like with uh, every uh, legislative uh, proposal that comes up, uh, we focus first on listening to the professionals and people who are boots on the ground. When there were communications with the DAs, with the police, where there was concern that that pool of money that needs to be quickly accessed so that if there is, you know, some kind of drug deal going on or some sort of, um, you know, uh, buy that, that the police need to make in their professional capacity, they were concerned, rightly so, that that would lag in the process. How are we going to get, you know, permission from our town managers or from our board of selectmen? It, it wasn't a workable solution. And that's why it's important that legislation be crafted with the thought of the people who are actually doing the work. And we were able to successfully move that bill forward. It's already uh, part of the law where um, uh, the DAs and the police um, lobbied and, and got what they needed and what they were due. Okay, thank you. We now move to question four. Recently, the Department of Housing and Community Development released its multifamily zoning requirements for MBTA communities. 
This requires MBTA communities to have at least one zoning district near a transit station where multifamily housing is permitted. What are the challenges of this plan and what I other ideas might you have to bring forward to address the affordable housing shortage? Each candidate will have three minutes. Senator Moran, you are first. Okay, I want to start this by saying don't get me started, uh, but I know that uh, I know that we're here now. So I, we have been fighting as a district this edict from Governor Baker, who I think um, has done a lot of things right. In fact, he gave me this pen um, from the K9 Nemo signing, which was terrific. I brought it here for good luck. And the, it's, it's what happens when legislation is crafted more for Boston. Uh, it doesn't work in, you know, Kingston, Plimpton, Plymouth, Pembroke. It, it, um, I've had many conversations with my town managers, with um, my housing experts, which we do, as, as I mentioned, routinely, and they they are just trying to, to continue to get the funding that they're due because that's what's at stake. They're being told they have to jump all of these hurdles in order to get the funding that they're used to having. They can't make those bars because they don't exist in the communities. Um, it's a great idea to have uh, housing centered around transportation, for example, and community um, assets like stores. Uh, walkability is great. It's healthy for people. It's good for the environment. Uh, it's good for the climate. But when you don't have it, you don't have it. That and the fact that the fabric of the community needs to be addressed. People don't necessarily want to look like other uh, towns. You know, pick anyone in and around Boston uh, in my district. And so in those conversations, I brought them right up to Secretary Keneally, whether uh, by letter, in person, uh, by email, and the administration was just hell-bent on the program that they decided. Um, well, the good news is that there is a change of administration coming because uh, my communities are still needing those funds for housing. And one of the first things that I did, in fact, I think Plymouth was just the second community in line, uh, Attorney General Maura Healy uh, and uh, Mayor Kim Driscoll made Plymouth, at my invitation, the second stop uh, recently. And it was right at Cordage Park where um, Vinnie DiMacito has had his office, Senator DiMacito, as, as well as I have had my office. And it's a terrific housing um, uh, development that's there. It's there in part because there's a train right there, which the administration through Governor Baker shut down. That doesn't make any sense. That is a wasted asset. It's a bad way to use infrastructure. And I'm glad that we're taking a look at it and hope to have a solution for you soon. Thank you, Senator Moran. Mrs. McRae, you have three minutes. Would you like me to repeat the question? Would you please? Recently, the Department of Housing and Community Development released its multifamily zoning requirement for MBTA communities. This requires MBTA communities to have at least one zoning district near a transit station where multifamily housing is permitted. What are the challenges of this plan and what other ideas might you bring forward to address the affordable housing shortage? Um, thank you for repeating. Uh, one thing that I will say right off the bat is that um, any time the government, you know, um, strong arms or puts certain mandates on things, I feel that that um, kind of throws some wrenches already right there. So the fact that um, HUD is is making some sort of uh, regulation or, or uh, uh, mandate, if you will, that we need to um, have a have a uh, it you know have this housing with uh, public transportation is going to be a huge issue, especially for our district. Um, you know, in the the Barnstable and uh, Plymouth Barnstable district, we only have a few um, locations where people actually um, could jump right off the transit authority. You know, through the transit MBTA and go home. So, um, any sort of restrictions on that, I think, would be a problem. One, things that, one thing that I will say that I think we need to do is we need to offer incentives to, um, to bring 
more housing, um, not just affordable housing, but, you know, workforce housing. You know, we've heard far too many stories of um, teachers, nurses, first responders in our communities. They can't afford to live in our communities. That, to me, is a problem. Um, not that they should be mandated, like in Boston, if you work for the police, I believe you still have to stay within the city limits. I'm not saying that that's something we should do, but I'm saying that we should um, be focused on providing um, housing that's affordable for all of our citizens, not just for citizens that, um, you, know, you know, fall within certain parameters. I also know of um, a young woman that's a nurse who actually has three children. She's raising her children by herself. And according to the HUD requirements, she doesn't qualify for, um, for any sort of assistance. And she's a nurse, you know, she's a hard worker, but because she's a single mom and she works her butt off and she brings in 78,000, I think it is, a year, um, because of her family size, she just misses the bar on that. So I think we need to look at, you know, some out, out of, um, you know, some new ideas. One could be uh, some of these new, um, some of the developers. Maybe they have some sort of offer where if they're going to put in, uh, you know, a certain amount of units that are for affordable housing, that, you know, maybe they have no, no tax, no sales tax on the supplies to build the house or something. There's got to be things that we can do to, to bring more work, uh, more affordable housing for everybody, including our workforce. Thank you. Senator Moran, do you wish to counterpoint? Sure, just quickly. Um, one of the important things folks should know is in the pending economic development bill, there is help for middle income folks. Uh, and I have lobbied strong for that and look forward to getting back on that and making it happen very, very quickly. One of the other things I think that um, should be a clear focus going forward, and we, we moved incredibly quickly, is the child care bill. Um, my bill, you can see it at um, the child care website. With, and the, the point of the matter is it helps businesses so that um, they'll be foundationally stronger. It um, lowers the price of childcare, even for middle-income folks, so that our nurse can, uh, as is my daughter nurse, can work without worrying about whether her child, my granddaughter, is in safe hands. So we need to look at the big picture for families of every uh, middle-income as well as lower-income. Thank you. Mrs. Thank McRae, you. would you... Care. One minute. Yes. Um, just really quick. Um, Senator Moran mentioned um, the child care bill. And I've actually done a, a little bit of research on this and talked to a couple of child care providers that are private um, providers. And they've said that they don't want to get involved with this child care bill and that they wouldn't support it. And, you know, as simple as I have, I have grand, two grandchildren, actually three grandchildren, that are in um, a preschool setting, a uh, little school. And there are so many restrictions and so many um, uh, regulations that it really kind of um, uh, clinches how much opportunity they have to expand and, and to do more. Um, one simple regulation that is um, through the Department of Ed, and I, I think that's who manages that, um, the child, child services, is um, something about sippy cups that... I have to bring my, my granddaughter at least four sippy cups because they don't have the authority um, to actually wash them throughout the day and refill them. Okay. We're going to go on to um, the final question. Each candidate actually will have the opportunity to ask their opponent a question. We will ask that you limit your question to one minute and that the response is limited to two. The moderators will reserve the right to use follow-up questions for both of you. Uh, and we're going to start this with uh, Mrs. McRae. You have one minute to ask any question you want of Senator Moran. Okay. Ooh, game on. This is the rumbling part, right, <laughs> Senator Moran? <laughs> we'll see. So, no, here's, here's my question. Um, what are your plans as a, as a state senator, as a legislator? Are your plans to, um, to remain a senator for 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Or are your plans to use this as a stepping stone to, to other opportunities? I thank you for that question. Um, I'll tell you, when I wasn't even thinking about being a state senator, and I got a call from another legislator, it was actually a text that said, 
are you planning on running? I hadn't thought about it at all. Wasn't even in my, you know, in my head. And I just thought of a pithy answer. I said, are you? Just those two words. And the response was, not if you are. And so I thought to myself, with my community experience and in the fact that coincidentally, my youngest had just gone off to college, which what's every mom's thought, I mm. could take on another job, <laughs> right? Uh, and it, you know, I had worked so closely with Senator DiMacito. Um, he, his constituency work was bar none. Um, he would literally call me on the way somewhere and say, I'm going to, you know, senior center. Um, what are your concerns as chair of the board of selectmen? What are the things, you know, so he did his research and that's something that I like to um, kind of emulate. He was, uh, you know, just the, that piece of it, you know, we all learn from our mentors and, uh, you know, looking at the future, um, my future is finishing this job that I started in the last term and a half. I mean, I ran against a whole slew of terrific candidates. I'm very grateful to have gotten the job and to have the opportunity to work as hard as I do. It's, um, this is my default. I, you know, I've helped people since I've been a young kid and that's um, what I'm best at. I'm best at using my skills at getting the community what it needs, um, whether it's legislation, uh, which is great to have a law degree to make that happen a little bit quicker, hopefully, um, but also in the assets that they need. And I have an understanding of that from my community work, of what exactly my communities work, and in conversations. Okay, thank you. And now, Senator Moran, you get one minute to ask Mrs. McRae any question, and Mrs. McRae, you'll have two minutes to answer. Great. Okay, Mrs. McCray, um, you're a member of the Budget Committee for the Bourne School Committee. The school committee has a budget of about $24 million. Can you just walk us through how that $24 million is currently being spent, what your priorities were in crafting that budget, and if you could make changes, what would they be? And if you have time, what are some actions you've taken on the school committee that you believe should be applied to other districts such as Plymouth? So, thank you for that question. Um, you know, when I, I've only been on the school committee for a little over a year, and just recently on the um, finance and budget um, committee. And I will say that one, one thing that I do and plan to continue to do on the school committee, even when elected, is um, to make sure that every single penny is um, accounted for and that we're giving the resources to the teachers um, and making sure that the, the tax dollars that we do um, bring in are allocated in the right way. Um, we, you know, we, we struggled with, um, when I first started, I found out that uh, as a teacher, um, I can't imagine not having my own independent um, laptop, if you will. And one thing that um, myself and uh, Paul McMaster, the co-chair of the committee, said, wait a minute, we have teachers that do not have um, school um, uh, assigned or whatever permitted uh, laptops. I'm like, that's ridiculous. So one of the first things that we did was to make sure that we put aside funding and we put aside um, money and we applied for grants and um, reached the, the communication uh, director that we had just hired and said this is a priori priority for us um, to make sure that they had their own private um, you know, uh, computer they could bring around with them and so on and so forth. And I think that one, another thing that we've, um, we've done is we've made sure that when we're you know, negotiating with the teachers for the contracts and things that we're mindful of, the, of what our budget is, we're mindful of what the town's budget is, and, and further expanding to uh, making sure that we can do more, um, especially as a senator, to encourage other districts to, to be as mindful about their budgets as well. Thank you. Candidates, we are now going to give you three minutes for closing remarks. Feel free to speak directly to the camera to address your voters and constituents. Senator Moran, you are first. Thank you. Uh, 
quick correction since that's part of this. Uh, commonstartma.org, my childcare bill, doesn't have anything to do with COVID restrictions and not sharing cups among children. Um, with that clarification, I just want to thank Amy and Julie, and thank you, Carrie. Um, I recognize that those of you out there watching are in need of real concrete action from your government. This is not a responsibility I take lightly. The district is filled with people of many backgrounds and many perspectives. It's my job to represent all of you. The good news is that there's so much more that unites us than divides us, and that with my experience, we won't skip a beat. What you're asking for is clear. You want to know that you'll be able to continue to live in your neighborhood without being driven out by the cost of rent or the mortgage or putting food on the table. But you also want more than that. You want leadership who will stand up for you and protect the rights that you hold dear. What I have proven over the last two years is that I can deliver the kind of leadership our district needs. I've also proven I can deliver results. I'm proud to have brought millions of dollars into our districts, investments big and small, 150,000 to study a Plymouth Area Convention Center, $40,000 for a new boiler at the fire station, $10,000 for Silver Lake Middle School Courtyard in Kingston, and a million for housing development. I'd like to close by quickly telling a story about why I do this work and what this role means to me. I can remember so clearly the experience of being a kid, sitting next to my dad in his wheelchair, handing out flags on the 4th of July. What I recognize now is that those happy people walking by us had no idea my dad was the same person who was the founding organizer of the event, the same person who had raised the funds, organized the coalitions, and made it run oh so smoothly. When the fireworks were over, we were also always the last ones picking up the trash. My dad instilled in me the lesson, when it comes to public service, there is no task too big, no task too small. That's exactly my approach to this job. Doesn't matter if I'm fighting up on Beacon Kill for millions of dollars of critical resources that we need, or sitting with a constituent one-on-one, -on -one, helping them work through an unemployment claim, you can bet I'm giving it my all. You can also bet I'm going to give it my all these last weeks between now and November 8th to earn your votes. If you want to get involved, go to www.votemoran.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'm humbly asking for your vote on or before November 8th. Early voting starts on October 22nd, so don't wait. Get out there and vote. Thank you all. Thank you. Mrs. McRae, your closing statement. You also have three minutes. Well, thank you again for hosting this event, and thank you, Senator Moran, for another great debate. So I thank you for that. Um, what sets me apart from my opponent? I, I'm relatable. I have to watch every single penny that I spend. I also I am a dedicated um, public servant. I will debate. I will ask questions. I will not go along to get along. I will advocate to reduce taxes. I won't vote in favor of any tax increases. I will advocate, advocate for veterans, especially when it comes to housing and their, their health and mental health. I will be transparent. I will show you how I vote on bills. I will vote in favor for more transparency on Beacon Hill. I will be accessible to the constituents. I will regularly meet with community leaders not just during the election cycle. I will be an advocate for small businesses. As your senator, I will always listen and address your individual concerns. I'm not a career politician, and nor do I want to be one. I believe in term limits. I have common sense and will apply it to every vote on every bill I vote on, support, or sponsor. I believe parents and guardians should have the final say when it comes to decisions regarding their children. I do not support mandates. I do not support driver's licenses for illegal immigrants. I will vote the will of the people. I will have the best interests of all constituents in mind with every vote. If I'm elected by you, the voters of the Plymouth and Barnstable District on November 8th to represent you in the State Senate, my primary duties will be to create, debate, and vote on legislation. I want you to know I will be a full-time senator. I will be dedicated to you, the constituents. 
I want you to know that I care about my community. I could care about our community. I want your voice to be heard on Beacon Hill, even if I don't always agree with it. I will respect you as a legislator. I will always be transparent about your opinions and concerns regarding certain legislation. I will vote the will of the people in the Plymouth and Barnstable district, regard, even if I don't agree with you. I will ask the difficult questions. I will work hard and will be dedicated to bringing the resources to our district that we specifically need. I will establish a re working relationship with the town select boards, administrators, um, uh, all, all of the administrators, town clerks to ensure that your specific needs are addressed. I will not let you down. If you'd like to support my campaign and the last four weeks that we have to the race, you can follow me at kerrymccray.com. You can email at kerrymccray.com or give me a ring. Thank you. Thank you both for participating in this forum. We wish you both the best of luck throughout your campaign and in the election. For our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. If you wish to watch this forum again, visit pactv.org slash election for replay times on PACTV's channels and on YouTube. And please make your choices heard by voting in the general election on Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you and good day. Thank you.